right, great. So my name is Ada Tai, as Chris has already mentioned.、Uh, this is my third year with Talent Pool doing the HR in the series, and、uh, I have been traveling around quite a bit with Talent Pool doing the series at different locations in the cities and、uh, remote locations as well. So. Today we are going to do. I am going to do two sessions in the morning. So you're going to be stuck with me for three hours, fortunately or unfortunately. And、uh, the first thing we're going to talk about this morning is on recruitment and onboarding. And a typical question I receive when people ask me, "What do you do?" I say, "I work in human resources." They're like, "Oh, you hire and fire." And I say, "Yes, that's typically the thing we do in HR, but that's not all about it." So by show of hands, how many of you have hired people before? Excellent. And how many of you would say that you've made a hundred percent correct choice every single time? <laughs> That's exactly how I feel too.、Um, I have, with my ten years of experience working in human resources, I have interviewed probably close to two hundred fifty people. I say that with experience, I do get better, but still, sometimes it can feel like a gambling game. That、uh, hiring people can feel like a hit and miss sometimes, but with experience, with careful planning and thought process, we can get better with it. So, with today's this morning's first session on recruitment onboarding, really want to、uh, instill the mindset of planning, the thoughtful planning process when it comes to recruitment and selection and onboarding. We're asking two questions. We're answering two questions this morning about recruitment and onboarding. Number one is why? Why do we need to hire? Can we just do it all by ourselves? Of course we can. And number two question or answer is about how. How are we going to do it so we have an effective process and a efficient results? So this is a little bit about me. Thanks, Kristen. I want to do an introduction of me, so I'm going to do it myself my way.、Um, so I work. I have been working in the field of human resources for the past ten years. And I have my、uh, MBA degree from the University of Alberta, and also my CPHR designation used to be called CHIRP, now it's the CPHR,、uh, as well as the Charter Manager designation as well. And、uh, two and a half years ago, I started my own HR consulting business. So I focus on helping organizations with HR issues,、uh, training facilitation, as well as coaching job seekers. And I also teach at University of Alberta, McEwen University, and Metro Continuing Education as a part-time instructor in Edmonton. And that's a picture of me presenting at Nate.、Um, often I'm re、uh, requested to speak on HR, networking, and、uh, business management topics throughout the province. And、uh, I am a millennial,、uh, believe it or not. And、uh, I believe in working in business and also in HR. That being a millennial, being the Younger generation. It's also about being pragmatic. We don't like politics. We don't like the fluff. Let's get straight to the point. So, what can we do more, but with less resources? Which reflects the economy today the way it is. So that's a little bit about me. And I got to walk around, talk to everybody. So I got to know you as well. So thank you for sharing your experience and knowledge with me.、Um, And this is my way experience teaching in university. I always ask the students hard questions before I share more knowledge. So the next couple of minutes, if you can, with your partners at your table, and、uh, discuss these questions. So first of all, how would you rate your organization's recruitment practice on a scale between one and ten, ten being the highest? The second question is, what are the top two challenges that your organization face in talent attraction? And the third question is, what would be the two contributing factors to those challenges? So let's do seven minutes. All right, back to me. So, is there any volunteer who like? Or first of all, let me ask the first question. Just by showing me your fingers, how would you rate your organization's hiring practice on a scale between one and ten? Thank you, everyone. So that's pretty good. Anywhere between no fingers at all <laughs> to、uh, a nine. So that's really good. So it's very diverse, which is very typical going around、um, doing the HR in the box series that we've ta I've talked to organizations, and that's exactly what I'd expected. Different organizations have different challenges when it comes to recruitment and selection, and some of them do a really good job, just a little bit to improve on. Some of them really are starting from the scratch. How about the second question? What are your top two challenges in terms of hiring people? Location, and I see everybody's nodding. Okay, that's good to know. What will be the other challenge? 
pay compensation. Okay. All right. So that's good to know. And what about the top two contributing factors to those challenges? Depends on what's happening in the local economy. Yes. If uh, the oil and gas is thriving, yeah. the talent pool is not as good <laughs> for our, because it's money, right? It's exactly. Yeah. It's totally understandable. And uh, again, so in HR, we're now solving the world's problem. We're now saying that we have a beautiful program, we're going to implement it, and tomorrow, tomorrow all the problems are going to be solved. In HR, we're not like that. In human resources, we try to help managements and guide them with best practices and in, in effective, uh, effectively implement the programs and test it along the way. And we also adjust and monitor due to different times in the economy, as well as the situations the organizations are going through, the different phases. So as I mentioned, when it comes to effective recruitment and onboarding process, it's really about the planning piece. The planning comes into two phases. Number one is the why. Number two is the how. So let's first ask ourselves, before we have a vacant position, and many times I've hear managers telling me, oh, when we have a vacant position, let's just jump on it and hire a replacement. Without asking why the previous person has left. And now knowing why the new hire didn't last very long, right? And also the organization is constantly changing just because, and the economy is changing just because we have vacant position, it doesn't mean we need to backfill it immediately the way how it was set up in the past. Right? So before we do an effective recruitment, we always ask ourselves the planning question, the why. So it could be growth, that the company is doing really well, so we're growing, we need more talents. It could be that we now we're growing a different direction. Diversifying the economy, diversifying the products and services we're offering, now we just need different uh, people with different backgrounds, different skill sets. It could also be the natural attrition, you know, the retirement, the resignations, the, the death, the leave of absences, or it could be just that uh, the terminations happen sometimes, either as layoff or um, uh, unwillingly being pushed out of the organizations, which sometimes happen too. And I often joke with the managers as saying that terminations will happen if you're in managers, not a matter of if, it's only a matter of when for you to complete your manager uh, career cycle. And yeah. Great, thank you. And uh, also with the planning process, we ask ourselves the why, and we also need to ask ourselves the how, which is how to do an effective recruitment onboarding process. In my humble opinion, there are a couple factors that take into place. So the cost, the people, the timeline, which gives us effective process, but at the same time, we also need to consider other factors such as the politics, the culture, the past practices, how have we done things in the past? What is our administrative process? And do we have a collective bargaining agreement that we need to abide by? So these are the factors that we'll explore throughout this morning's presentation. So first of all, let me give you some of my definitions when it comes to recruitment. I had really uh, dumbed it down or simplified the definition of recruitment. And there is a slight difference between recruitment and selection. So recruitment, it's a really a process. That's why I keep saying it's a planning, it's a thought process. It's a process to first locate where the talents are, identify the kind of talent we need, and that really ties back to the why piece. Why do we need to hire? When we have a really good planning, then we ask ourselves, okay, what kind of talent can we identify? How can we attract them? And then, the talents also include volunteers. We have a couple of nonprofit organizations here in the room that volunteers sometimes we need to recruit just as much as our regular staff. And selection is also a process. It's first evaluating what kind of talents pool that we had collected through our application process and how can we engage them throughout the entire selection process. If there are really competitive talents, Maybe they're being offered somewhere else. So how can we keep them warm and fuzzy, engaged with us throughout the entire process, and at the end, that we choose them and they onboard with us smoothly and hoping to stay with us for an effective longer period of time. And here I really highlighted the most suitable talents instead of just any talents. 
there is no best talent in my personal opinion. It's also about the fit. And the fit comes to what's most suitable to our organization's needs and our culture. When it comes to cost factors, so I mentioned there are four factors, right? Cost, people, timeline, and others. So when it comes to cost, we really need to ask ourselves, okay, now we identify we truly need to hire. We ask the why question, we identify we truly need to hire. Let's think about how much money we have. How much money do we have in our budgets, right? Sometimes some organizations, their budgets are managed by HR. Some organizations, their recruitment dollars are managed by the line managers or senior managers of the area, if you will. According to a 2016 um, survey in, done by the United States, the um, uh, Society of Human Resources Management, which is the counterpart of CPHR here in Canada, um, their research shows that the average cost for a professional level of position being hired is just over 4,000 US dollars. So that's 2016 figures. That figure has gone up these, uh, these days. And takes 42 days, so which is a month and a half, right? so six weeks. And that's just to fill a position in the frontline or professional level position. We're now counting the extreme, which is the senior level, the VPs or, or the CEOs. Those will take a lot longer and it will be a lot more costly to recruit for. When we ask ourselves, okay, how much budget do we have? We also need to factor into the cost. The advertisement cost where you put on Monster, LinkedIn, Iluta, Kijiji sometimes even, or ask people for referrals and you pay referral bonus, all of these would be part of the advertisement costs. And that's the most obvious. I often see company managers or HR report their recruitment costs, they typically would just report the advertisement costs because it's quantifiable. It's the most obvious. But let's not forget behind the scenes there are a whole bunch of other factors that we need to cost into, take into consideration, such as the HRs and hiring managers time. If we quantify that by a dollar amount times how many hours we're actually having these people spent doing these kind of work, the loss of productivity. So if we have a vacant position, the person gives us two weeks of notice. And let's use the average of six weeks to backfill a position. What about four weeks in difference? Who is going to cover the slack and who is going to do the work? If we have the current employees doing the work, do we have to pay overtime? Right, so those are all money. And also when we have a new hire come on board, we also need to train that new hire Integrate, which we'll talk about in the second half of today's presentation, that's also productivity loss and money that we spend on the coworkers now doing their own job but training a new hire. The worst case you can have is that new hire stay with you for a couple of weeks and then they leave. <laughs> so the steps to hire, and again, I have really simplified the steps into four essential steps. Plan and prepare, post and shortlist, interview and background check, and offer on onboards. So first of all, when you do the plan and prepare, and I always stress on the importance of doing a thoughtful planning process, because without thoughtful planning process, we will lose money and lose the effectiveness of hiring the new person if eventually. First, we need to think about what does organization want to achieve from these talent that we bring in, we want to bring to the organization. Do we just want them to do a you know, a typical repetitive job that don't need much of thinking process? Or do we want to have, create a sense of community? Or do we want to pr promote a brand name of our organization? Or do we want to help people to develop, develop skills? So all these questions that we ask ourselves are part of the planning process. Then once we have that answered, we ask ourselves, how do we recruit? How do we hire? What are the steps? Who needs to be involved? Who should be involved? which is the people factor, how much it will cost, and how do we evaluate when the recruitment process is finished, how effective were we as an HR and hiring manager committee? How can we evaluate our effectiveness? Is it simply by seeing how long the new hire will stay with us? Or is it by engagement surveys that we do on an annual basis? Or maybe it's regular conversations, observations, maybe it's the stay interviews, Hopefully it's now the exit interviews. 
And then we get down into the details, putting the job description together. We know the job description translates to a job posting. And then we start doing the recruitment process, get our hiring managers on board, trained, all of that good stuff. Step number two is the post and shortlist. So we understand, understood by now the kind of talent we need. How do we want people to apply? Again, this goes back to the why piece. What kind of talent? Why do we need to hire? What kind of talent are we trying to attract? If it's a younger generation, posting a poster in the community hall may not be as effective if we have a Facebook group, Facebook group, right? Or if we just want to get people to come to work for us on a seasonal basis or short period of time, um, the skills is not so important. Maybe using a temp staffing agency or using employee referrals may be our best bets. So really in our posting, we need to be specific in how people can apply and really ask ourselves, where should we post these advertisements? And don't get me wrong, the job posting is truly an advertisement. It's a promotion. It's no different than us selling our secondhand car on Kijiji. We can't just leave a couple of sentences and hoping people will come and knock on the door saying, here are $10,000 even though you asked for eight thousand, right? So it's really about how can we make the posting attractive? Because we are in a, we're engaging a diverse talent pool. So how can we make it attractive that people want to come to work for us? We spend least amount of effort in recruitment, but most qualified people come to a knock on our door. I always joke about that recruitment process is like a speed dating process. When you have the job descriptions, really looking at our, ourselves and thinking, okay, this is me as a person. Think about how I look, what kind of quality of, of partner I'm looking for. Put that into attractive ad, which is the job posting. Then go through the shortlist process. Not everybody message me that I'll go out for dinner with, right? And then the dinner will be your interview process, which is the speed dating process. And then the onboarding probation will be your cohabitation phase. <laughs> and I always joke about that um, if this relationship doesn't work out, well, fire, right? Before the probation ends. So it's same as if you don't like the new partner you brought into the house, kick him out or her out <laughs> before the kids had taken into place, right? So really prepare an eye-catching posting. It's about how can we attract the kind of talent we want? What kind of wordings do we use that's aligned with our organization's cultures and values? And what is really appealing to the talent pool that we are tapping into? How can we get the word out? What's the most effective methods? Use multiple methods. We can't just rely on posting on our website and thinking that lots of people would just apply, right? And also, how can we screen candidates, develop consistent criteria? We can't just say that we like this person other than that person because this person is five centimeters taller, right? So we have to use job-related, consistent, justifiable criteria to evaluate the candidates. The next step is the interview and background check. So we determine who, and this is a people factor, who should be involved in the recruitment process. And I often talk to the hiring managers, ask them, how often do you hire? When was the last time you've hired someone? If they told me the last time they've hired someone was more than a year ago, I always say, let's just have a quick 15 minutes chat before we go into the interview room. Let me prep you again with the recent updates of employment standards, what questions you can or cannot ask, how do we present ourselves professionally during the interview process because we are the ambassador of the organization. We are the first faces that the candidates see. And this day and age, the younger generation apply for a job. It's not that they're begging you for a job. In some circumstances, they may because their parents told them so. But in most of the situations, you're evaluating them. They're also evaluating you. You are the first faces they see of the organization. So if you, the HR people or the managers, don't represent organizations as a good ambassador, guess what the candidates will see, will understand? This is not where I want to work. And then your recruitment effort and dollars just went into the toilets because it's a waste, right? And guess what? The rumors do carry. They do travel really fast, especially in a smaller community. So I always talk to my hiring manager. So if you have an interview last year, let's have a quick prep, just 15 minutes. I'm not going to bore you too much with all the theories and processes. So just go through a couple of things, who, who is going to do what parts, 
what role are we playing? Good call, bad cop, who is going through the hose, who is offering a seat and chair and, and water, all that stuff. So we have that planning in our, in our heads. And then we select the suit, again, suitable candidates. Doesn't mean they're the best top candidates, suitable for the current situation and the organization. And determine the kind of background checks that we need to go through to have these talents checked. So in the recruitment process, we're, when we assess the candidates, we're really answering three questions, or having three questions being answered. First of all is, can the candidates do the job? Basically, do they have the technical knowledge, skills, abilities to do the job? The second question is, will they do the job? What's their motivation? Why do they want to come to work here? Do they just look for a paycheck because their mom told them so? they're being kicked out of the house if they don't find a job? <laughs> or they want to get a job because they were just terminated and they just need a job to fill in the gap to pay the bills? Or they really want to join you because your organization's values, cultures, and, and products and services attract them. It's alignment. And also you offer that professional development opportunity for them so they can grow their career. And they have the skills, knowledge, and abilities, and the willingness. And on top of that, will the candidate fit in? Again, this is where the suitable piece come into place. They could have the top 4.0 GPA out of 4.0. They could have the 10 years of experience when you're looking for five. But if their personality, if their behaviors do not align with organizations, cultures, and values, they may not fit in. And at the end, if they don't fit in, we all know what's going to happen. Right? So again, it's recruitment dollars and effort wasted. And do remember, we represent organizations. I keep saying this all the time because when we make an offer, we also want to notify the unsuccessful candidates. And that's my pet peeve. I always train my hiring managers, let the unsuccessful candidates know, thanks, but not this time. Simple as that. You can use a generic, you can use a, a customized template rejection letter. All it takes is just push a button to send email to the, to the unsuccessful candidates. It's a courtesy. Treat the candidates how we want to be treated. Imagine you spend all the time and effort going to a recruitment process, and you think that you are in the last stretch, and you're so close, they hired your competitor. OK, that's OK. I already broke my heart. But if I don't even receive a courtesy email or phone call, it's just leaving a really bad taste in my mouth. And guess what? I am going to talk about it, and I talk about it, and the rumors start it. It's so hard to build an organizational reputation, but it's very easy to destroy it. And also deliver a comprehensive orientation training program, which we'll talk about pretty soon, and give the employer volunteers their handbooks as part of the onboarding process. For those of you who are in the nonprofit business, the CEO of Chicago Cares explained that nonprofits who engage the volunteers are better. Um, as an organization, they manage better and they are more adaptable and capable of doing, uh, going to the scale. So that's the hiring piece. And we all know that we don't want our new hire to leave us tomorrow, which I had seen situations like that happen. And uh, I had also seen candidates leave us or new hire leave us in the first couple weeks, months. And I think that's a recruitment error that we could have done better so they don't leave us that quickly. There must be something going on that we didn't know prior to their joining us or during the onboarding process. So it's important that we attract the best talent to our organization, but it's also important for us to retain the suitable talent with us and motivate them to do a good job. So let me ask you this question without looking into my slides. How, what will be the top factors for you to stay with an organization? Oh, Jeff, go ahead. <laughs> uh, being stretched. Being stretched. Being, being challenged, being stretched. That's exactly it. Please. Uh, growth. growth and developments. Anybody? Yes. Culture. Culture. Anybody else? Mind. Thank you. I was waiting for someone to say that. Yeah, that's great. And it's interesting when I teach at university and my students are typically in the third and fourth year HR program. So I asked them, let's do a survey. Write on a piece of paper, what are your top five values? Why do you want to get a job? Why do you want to stay with a job? And guess what? 
the younger they go, um, I am generalizing, stereotyping, but the younger they go, compensation will become the top, if not top one, top two factors for them. As we mature in our career stages, as we grow and develop our professional career, compensation actually drops. And it becomes, it's the challenges, it's the environment, it's the leaders, it's the culture, the reputation, values, and most importantly, my direct supervisor. So we all know that 75% of people leave a job not because the job itself sucked, it's actually because their manager is so bad. However, 89% of managers, when they receive a resignation from the employee, they think, oh, they just got another better job. Nothing about them, right? So in my opinion, um, there are four factors, or four and a half, five factors to satisfy and productive employees. First of all is the direct supervisor, the work itself, which is the challenge piece. And the research uh, or uh, news published that I've read is that in the Canadian household, if the husband and wife, so if the couple, the annual salary exceeds 75K uh, as household income, the value of more money brings to the happiness actually diminishes. It's more the professional development, it's more the challenge, the engagement, the workplace that brings them that happiness and satisfaction. The organization culture, the values, the relationship, the fit, the enjoyments, the, the opportunities to do more. And compensation is important, but let's not just look at compensation like what my students will look at the base pay. It's the total compensation package that we're valuing, right? Same as the candidates. Do we understand their motivations? So is it just the base pay they're going after? Or are they also looking at you know, the healthcare benefits? What do we offer to attract them, to engage them? What if their life needs change? What if they were single when we hired them, now they have a family, right? It could also be the retirement package that we offer, whether it's RSP or a defined contribution or defined benefits plan that we offer in our organization. And of course, let's not discount the personal factors that also brings into workplace. I would now say that I come to work every day 200% engaged like a robot. I mean, I'm a person, sometimes the personal situation do affect me, right? If I'm sick, I'm not feeling 100%, I don't, I don't perform at 200%. And the same with employees. They're all humans and things do happen in our lives. Family circumstance change, health issues, um, spouse needs to relocate, so I have to quit, then I have to join spouse in another location. It could also be that my career interest changed. Especially now in this economy, at least in Alberta, I have seen lots of uh, employees being laid off. And what happened is now they took this opportunity and going back to colleges and universities to get themselves retrained or upgraded. So things do happen in employees' life, and if their interests also change, these are things that we cannot really control as an organization. But what, what we can manage are these factors. Okay? With these, we can provide resources and support and tools, but there's not, there is only so much we can do. Also without tapping into too much of the privacy of the employees. The onboarding process after recruitment is critical, critical to retain a new hire. And the new hire goes through the phases of being hired, being orientated, being onboarded, integrated, fully integrated, and developed. So let me ask you this question. How long does it typically take you to figure out if you want to stay with a new company or not? A couple of weeks, yeah. Anybody? Yeah, yeah. Anybody say six months? Yeah, so typically 90% of people will decide if they want to stay or not within the first six months. So first six months is critical, critical for organizations to make sure they have regular dialogues with their new hire so their recruitment effort and dollars don't go waste. And uh, also that they can maintain a really good environment for their new hires. But the interesting fact here is that to break even for the time, money, and effort that we spend into the recruitment process, just hired, oriented, it may take a couple of days, right? It's the orientation process may be just a couple of days. That's not one at the new hire break even. 
for a frontline position, you know, customer service representative or labor position or really frontline clerk, those uh, frontline positions, they take about three to six months, sorry, a month and a half to three months to break even. So just to break even for frontline positions. But for mid-level positions, professionals like ourselves in this room, it takes about on average six months to break even. And again, the 90% of people decide if they want to stay with an organization or not in the first six months. However, only 15% of organizations will extend their effort beyond the first six months to retain and onboard, or continue onboard, integrate their new hires. So such a huge gap there. For senior level, the, again, the VPs and CEO positions, it takes anywhere between a year to two years to break even. So if the CEO or, or the VPs leaves us in a year or so, we haven't got our benefits back at all from the new hire. So this is where it all starts from the moment we shake hand with our new hire saying, welcome aboard. Now you got your offer. I have to reject a whole bunch of others. <laughs> Congratulations. This is where the relationship starts. But let me ask you this question. How many organizations here have a great communication between the day they sign the offer with the new hire to the day the new hire actually starts with them? That's great. So what kind of communication do you have with your new hire? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, 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 go ahead. Um, after the employee decides they want to come work the company, I set up a signing meeting with them so they come in and see me and we go through the offer. Excellent. There, and then you hire people to get everything set up with payroll or not. Oh, wow, that's and excellent. That's and that's, that's right. Yeah, because we all know sometimes it can take weeks, even months, for a new hire to start after the, the day they sign the offer letter, right? Personal situations, I need to take a vacation, my mom is sick, or I need to give resignation. Um, I want to do more than just a typical two weeks because I've been there for a long time, yada, yada, yada. So many things could happen. And that longer period, the longer we wait for a new hire to start, more changes could have happened during that process. I've also dealt with situations that our competitive new hires are, con are attempting, um, uh, thinking about different offers on the table, right? So they're just buying more time with us so they, they know there are their offer coming and they use that offer as an opportunity to negotiate or think through for themselves. So many things could have happened during that process. And research tells us that 60% of new hires in Canada believes that there is a lack of communication from the day they sign the offer to the day they actually start with the organization. And yet only 40% of organizations think they have good communication process in place. So it's critical for us to maintain that communication with the new hire even prior to their first day. Give them a call, send them an email, the contact information is critical, maybe also send them a policy handbook so they can familiarize themselves prior to the start date so they don't spend more time just reading the policies sitting at your desk on their day one. Forms, have them join company events. That could also happen. And also as a HR or manager, we're busy too before our new hire start with us, right? So we have IT, finance, HR process set up, office set up, have the phone, computer, technology. I've also read a research that in the United States, the millennials will tell you that if technology is not in the workplace when they start, they immediately feel disengaged. It's just the day and age has changed. So let's make sure that our millennial, millennials new hire do not get disengaged from their, their day one or first morning. Let's make sure that these things we can set up, we set them up properly prior to they start. And also let's confirm that new hire, yes, it's been five weeks since you signed off or you are going to start with us. Just let me double check with you things because things do happen, right? And also once that's confirmed, we send out new hire announcements so everybody knows who is coming, what to expect. Assign a body to greet the new hire at the reception desk when the new hire comes and tour around the new hire for the first day and et cetera. 
And let's ask ourselves, who is responsible for this process? Who should be responsible? It's not just the responsibility of, responsibility of HR of all these duties. The hiring manager, the hiring team, and the colleagues of the new hires team also play a huge role in the entire process for the new hire to feel welcomed, engaged. Then the day one of new hire starts, shake hands, have the body, body greet the new hire at the, at the front desk, give them the PPE, the personal protective equipment, if this is a safety sensitive position, the uniforms, tour around, and have people coaching the new hire, working along, answer questions, bounce ideas off, because treat them like how you want to be treated on your day one. We want to put our best behavior forward on our day one until whenever we pass probation, probably. And we're confused. We don't know what the washrooms are, the fire exits, all of these critical questions. We need someone there, right there, to answer our questions and help us. And policies, manuals, whatever resources that new hires need, let's get them all in one place, sorted out, ready to go for the new hire. Day one. Yeah, go ahead. Um, we do all of that. Yeah. Very well. Oh, yes, I forgot about that. We do that well, um, but the question I have is with reference to the employees themselves, I find that they feel a bit overwhelmed. Yes. How do you manage that? Yeah. So that's why the orientation onboarding is, again, it's a process. It's really a planned process. So with the organization that I recently consulted for and um, I help them develop a uh, recruitment to onboarding process. So I basically give them a layout of what you need to do on day one. So not too heavy. So day one basically have somebody greet, the new hire, give them PPE, the uniform, the box, go to the desk and designate at least an hour for a new hire to sit at the desk, sort things through. So that's the quiet time, right? The downtime for a new hire to reflect, to go through things, to ask more questions. And also maybe take new hire out for lunch. No alcohol, hopefully. And uh, so that's also an engagement piece, the social interaction between new hire and the manager and the new, and the new teams. And then let the new team be ready, knowing who is coming. I've also had a situation, a new hire show up at the front desk. Nobody knows who this person is. And the security guy just walked into him and saying, who are you? <laughs> that's the wrong approach to, to welcome a new hire, right? And also, so day one to day three, then there are many things we do. So let's stage them, basically whatever that works for the organization. I mean, all of these are on, on the slides that you receive on USB as well as your handouts. So check, cut them out, see what fits your organization's culture, policies, procedures. Also make sure that we have the week one or week two schedule uh, set up, established, ready. So everybody plays a role in this entire onboarding process and knows what to expect. So if the hiring manager knows that I am the critical person, I'm going to spend lots of time with my new hire, let me just block my calendar for the first however many days or weeks so I spend quality time with my new hire. And I've also seen managers that think he or she is going to spend quality time with new hire and yet spends almost no time because things happen, they have to firefight, right? So do we have a backup plan? That's also important. Up until the first week, the new hire also needs some downtime just on himself or herself going through the internet, the internet, the policies, the procedures and ask questions. It's not a bad idea to give a directory to the new hire with people's name um, uh, and uh, contact information, the email, uh, phone number, the title, and organizational charts ready as well. The more complex your organization is, the better we have. It is better for us to have all these resources ready. So when me, new hire, knows I have a payroll question, I don't go through the 200 names in HR and trying to figure out who should I call, right? I know exactly who is my contact. And one more thing to mention here is that the managers book regular one-on-ones in the calendar right from the get-go. So the one-on-one -on -one is the, as the name suggests, suggests the one-on-one -on -one time. It's not just the first day, it's not just the first week, let's set the performance expectations. It's also about on an ongoing basis, do I meet with my employee every two weeks or every month? So let's block these things on our calendar. It's about, sincer it's about sincerity. It's about how I treat my employees. I want to manage them. 
because how they're being treated is reflected in their engagements, reflected in their productivity. When it comes to the organizational orientation, there are also four quadrants, if you will, that I suggest to be covered. So when it comes to the organization itself, who are we? What's our, team, what's our structure like? What's our culture like? What's our history like? Who are our cu customers? What in industry are we in? And how did we grow to where we are today? What are challenges, barriers? Let them be clear with our new hires from the get-go. And also, who are our competitors? <coughs> and also the team, the policies, the functions, the safety, the dress codes. The dress code is not a common sense anymore. Let me just be very clear about that. So if there is an expectation of your new hire about dress code, make sure that's very clearly laid out before the day one. So when they show up on day one, there is no bending of the dress code rule. And also safety, the fire access, the master point, these are the musts, right? It's very clearly right at the beginning. About the job, so if I'm the manager sitting down with my new hire, I blocked quality time with my new hire. So I talk about the position. I don't just talk about what you're going to do in the position that today you hit a button here, tomorrow you process an Excel calculation. It's not like that, right? We hire people for their knowledge, skills, abilities, and the willingness to come to work us, for us and hoping that they're, they're suitable for us as well. So we don't tell them exactly step by step what to do. But what we're explaining about the position is our expectations when it comes to technical results, so the technical part of the job, but also the behavior, behavioral expectations. So dress code is not a common sense. Behavior sometimes is not a common sense either. What's considered appropriate, professional for our organization might be different from your previous organization. So let's just be very clear from the get-go. Also set goals. And internal, external key contacts. So if your new hire are serving customers, clients, have vendors to deal with, contractors, whatever situation may be, let's also make sure that me as the manager or me as the buddy, that I take my new hire to meet with the external contacts, introduce, meet and greet. If it is a remote location, then phone call or Skype, whatever may, works. Also for the new hires, it's important to know the not so obvious. Because remember, 90% of people decide if they want to stay with you or not in six, six months, right? For six months. So what are some of the reasons cause them to leave are typically not so obvious ones. Not written in a policy book that I can read off on my own. It's about the feel. Do I fit in, right? Do I feel I fit in? And where does the feel come from? It's the culture. Now what you say the culture is. What well, the culture I believe, I feel, that I experienced here was the norm. What are past practices? You hire me because you think I'm creative, I'm innovative, I have fresh, great ideas. But actually when I come, I realize that every time I, have, I suggest something new, you shut me down immediately, right? Which has happened. I've, I've seen that happen in the workplace. So let's talk about all these not so obvious right at the beginning and me new hires asking those questions. And of course, what employees cares? Pay and benefits. Who should I go to if I have a question about my pay and benefits? When does my benefit start? How can I add my beneficiaries? Are you going to match my RSP just 1% higher or how can I get more, for example? How flexible is the workplace? The hours are flexible, the culture is flexible, or do I have to be at my physical desk Monday through Friday, nine to five-ish, right? And what about manager's managerial style? And that's also very important to be communicated with the new hire right from the beginning. What can I expect from my manager? What keeps my manager up in the night? How can I not be that troublemaker, but be the problem solver? What kind of problems can I help you solve, right? So the manager, we need to be frank about those as well. So our new hires have a clear understanding what, to, what they're jumping into and how they can become effective very soon. What's the best communication methods here? Is it in person, over email, over a phone, over Skype, or text messages, or maybe even a messenger chat? And who do I talk to if I have questions, and where can I find information? The first one to three months is also critical. So the new hire goes through more training, and 
get familiarized with the team, going out for lunches, going through more formal training, informal training. They feel on the surface, they look excited, they want to show they're excited, they're engaged, but really underneath, they feel overwhelmed. They're like, oh, I'm so tired after I go home every night. And I feel that myself too, once I join a new organization, the first couple of months when the evenings when I go home, I just don't have energy anymore because I give 200% of my energy during the day to put my best behavior forward, hoping that I can stay here. And, uh, but also just a few more tips for the first three months. Treat a new hire like how you want to be treated when you start with an organization. Always go back to when you start with the new organization, how you felt. What can we do? How can we be more thoughtful? And it's, just, it's not just we're wasting time now. We're actually saving time later. And how can we com continuously communicate, observe the barriers, the challenges, the behaviors of our new hire? And we have regular check-ins. We do stay interviews. So stay interviews can be a survey that's sent out by HR, hoping the employees will fill out as comprehensive as possible, right? It could be a conversation. It could be a water cooler chat, just, hey, how are things going? A marketing company in Edmonton, which I found was fascinating by doing this, is every week they send out a survey monkey to their other employees asking three questions. How was your week? The first question. Second question, what are challenges? Third question, what can leaders do better to help you this week? So they send out a survey with these three questions every week just to find out what we call stay interview, find out how the employees truly feel, how they're truly doing. And if there are barriers and challenges, let's remove them from the get-go. And unfortunately, or fortunately, sometimes if we have to let the new hire go, let's let them go early. Let's not wait until the problem is too big that we cannot solve, but to pay them out. After three months, finally a pass probation, right? The new hire pass probation. I feel like that I can do a little bit more by myself, more acquainted with my coworkers, feel like mentally and socially I'm stronger. But after six months, I feel like I can do more and more independently on my own, multitask, can answer questions instead of just asking questions, be that resourceful person, and being feeling that I'm finally getting integrated. And 12 months passed, I have done my first, as a new hire, the first round of performance uh, review with my managers. I don't know, some organizations do it on a quarterly basis, semi-annual basis, some do it on an annual basis. So now I've done my annual performance review, know where I'm st standing, and uh, also had regular check-ins and conversations with my manager. Now I feel like, hmm, I feel pretty good. I'm staying here, I feel safe, I feel engaged. I know what I'm doing here, but, we had also talked about to engage, to make employee happy, engage and satisfy, stay and productive. It takes a couple of factors, right? And the one thing that ties all these four factors together is that professional growth. So that's where the develop piece come into place is if I stay here now, I've been here for over a year, do I have a future here? I know how to do the job. I know who to go to for resources and questions. I can help your company solve problems. I think I'm doing okay. But do I have a future here? That would determine how long I want to stay. And the future could mean that I grow my career horizontally. I do more in the current level. It could be mean vertically that I get promoted, or it could be a hybrid approach. And professional development, it doesn't always mean just promotions. It could also mean enlarging my job, that I'm doing more tasks, I'm more doing more duties. Give me more challenge, more projects. Maybe I'm leading a project, maybe I'm leading a case studies. Um, it could also be attending seminars, trainings. Uh, whatever is catchy, whatever is trendy, I'm doing research best practices for our organization. So think creatively that professional development also that's aligned with our budgets, aligned with what are we want to achieve as an organization. So if the economy is changing, our organization is changing, our expectation of our employees are also changing, but we're not giving them the tools and resources for them to manage change properly, we have failed ourselves, right? So in order for us to develop them and for them to stay with us and be engaged is that professional development, prof career development piece that's driving it, driving behind it. Yeah. 
just a question about professional development. Sure. Um, especially with uh, younger people coming on board. Yeah. Um, the expectation of them is that they should be able to get professional development right away. <coughs> and I'm just wondering what sort of the norm is as far as professional development. That's different than training for the job. Professional development is something more, I, I feel. A absolutely, yeah. So with your college, you actually have an advantage. You can offer training so easily, right? But training may not work for everyone, right? And all of us learn different ways. I see as I go through the presentation, some of you are jotting down notes. Some of you are just listening, you're nodding. Some of you even have eyes closed. That's okay too, right? So even with my students, people have different learning styles and they grow differently, right? Some people are more visual, some people were more kinesthetic, and some people are more hearing, they learn from hearing. So everybody's different. So it all comes down to that conversation. If me, the manager, I have regular check-ins, regular conversations with my employees, that PDPs, the professional development, is part of the conversation. What would you like to achieve in your career? It would be a great question to discuss with your employees, not just the new hires, right? So what would you like to achieve? How can I help? Sometimes it could be just that move me to a different project. I want to learn that project. Give me more tools, or I just want to take an Excel class, for example. It could be as simple as that. It could be as difficult as I want to become the CEO of this organization. And with the younger generation, I mean, when I first graduated from university, I, I was not doing that stretch, but I was doing something like asking employers, how can I become a manager here tomorrow? <laughs> so a little bit overly ambitious. And it's happening with the younger generation. So it's really about engaging them into the conversation. Don't get me wrong, some people are happy doing the, the same job year over year. Doesn't mean their productivity is, lo is low, doesn't mean their satisfaction is not there. They're just happy with who they are, what they're doing, while they can keep a work-life balance, right? So there's nothing wrong with that. So it's a customized approach. It's really about personal question. What do you want to achieve in your career? How can I help? And the answers are very diverse. You sometimes will find employees say, I don't know, you tell me. <laughs> and I always throw the question back at them. This is your life, this is your career. If you don't know, I don't know how to help you. Think about it, let's come back and have this conversation again. For the interest of time, so, um, Part of this series doing the presentation, we have case studies. Um, so for this first presentation in the morning, it's not really a case study. So I thought it would start a little bit easier because the second presentation will have a harder case for you. Um, in your printouts, there is the new hire orientation checklist. So it's basically from my slides that I just put them into a chart format. With the people, if you have people from your same organization, have a discussion, see what you can do to customize and take into your organization's onboarding process. If you're by yourself, you can sit with anybody you like and just have that conversation. So let's do 10 minutes of that. Instead of 15, we don't have enough time. All right, so back to me. I really appreciate the atmosphere here in the room. I think this worksheet actually got your conversation started and have more brainstorming, so that's really good. A couple of questions came along the way as I walk around the room is the, the policy. So organizations sometimes they pay their employees to sit at us and to go through the policies, but maybe they're too busy at the beginning of the job, so they really couldn't have the time to go through the policies. And also with the younger generation, they find it a little boring, right? A little dry to go through hundreds of pages that constantly get changed, right? So a couple of organizations I've uh, um, looked at into, they do it in the video, formats of the policy. Some organizations do in the gaming formats and have you go through video game quizzes at the end to make sure that you learn the content. Some organizations do it in the audio, so they have the best voice in the company to speak the policies and summarize it and have you listen to it on your way home or way to work. And again, different people have different learning styles, so really offering multiple options, whatever works for you. Um, some organizations I've done consulting work for is uh, we also do it at our team week, weekly or, or semi-monthly team meetings. Let's just go through two policies at a time together, answer questions and go through them. Let's do, let's use that as a team building event even to some extent, get a conversation started. Or at your retreat, 
probably don't want to really talk about policies, but yeah, about game, but or golfing, right? Um, so whatever really works for the organizations. The other thing that I have seen and I suggest to do is uh, to have an annual sign off on the policy handbook, especially if that you update your policy handbook on, on a regular basis. So employees are familiar, familiarized at least with most recently updated policy books. So that's the questions that collected as I walk around. And so let's make sure that we put time and effort into the onboarding integration process and procedures. Because re-recruitment, as we learned, is very important, is very expensive and it's a damage to the morale as well. Because if we come back to a position six months, 12 months, employees are losing their confidence. And also the complaints will come arise because they're doing constantly over time. And they're even questioning, okay, well, if the position's vacant for six months, do we really need to backfill it? Right, so many questions will come your way. So let's make sure that efforts go into recruitment as well as onboarding, which is critical to attract and retain and motivate a good worker. Yeah, go ahead. So in your experience, uh, what would be a typical um, kind of onboarding period? Is it, you know, a week? Is it two weeks? Is it six months? Is it a year? Sorry, I'm going to get you to speak to the microphone. Okay. Yeah. So in your um, experience, uh, typically what would be an onboarding uh, period of time? Is it, you know, like one week, two weeks, six months? What's right. the typical onboarding kind of length of time. Yeah, so it really depends on the organization, how complex the organization is, how many structures, layers, policies, procedures you have. The more you got these, the longer it will just take for your average person to get, get acquainted, get familiarized with all the materials and, and requirements. From a psychological perspective, we've talked about that break even. Uh, from a financial perspective, we talk about that break even points, right? The one and a half to three months for frontline, six months for middle professional level positions, and a year to two years for senior executive positions. That's financial dollars. Psychologically, it really depends on the person. We could do as much as we could in our effort to make sure that we've covered everything, being thoughtful, giving them tools or resources. But at the end of the day, it's that employees mentally, do I want to be onboarded? Do I want to be integrated? Do I feel I fit in? And the fit piece, again, goes back to the planning of the recruitment process. What's the motivation? Why do you want to work here? And then how can I help to develop you, to help you to grow your career? And also it's the ongoing dialogue. So even if I have been with an organization for five years, it doesn't mean that I'm not new here anymore. If I change a position, if I get promoted or uh, relocated, redeployed, I need to be reboarded again. <laughs> Right? And also maybe circumstance changing in my life that I went on a parental leave, come back, I may need to be reintegrated again. <coughs> so it really depends on the situation. Any other questions? Okay, I guess we'll take a 10 minute break. 15. 15.